Hi, we're here today to talk to you, you guys about the ethics of hacking. You know, how is it that there's all these hackers out there and how is it that we know that we're doing something good with all of the knowledge and the skill set that they have? And I'm joined by two extremely esteemed guests. Uh, I'm joined by Katie Masuris and Chris Roberts. Katie is the founder and CEO of Luda Security, and Chris is the CISO and chief hacker of the Hillbilly Hit Squad. So I'm super happy to have you both here today. Um, could you please both take a few words and introduce yourselves as well? Sure. Thanks, Jaya, for inviting me. And um, it's a pleasure to be here with you and with Chris and to uh, join the virtual South by Southwest conference. Um, I've had the experience and the, the benefit of speaking at the live event in the past. So this, this should be interesting. Um, but as you said, I'm the founder and CEO of Luta Security. We're a company that's been around for almost five years. And I launched this company about, uh, you know, just a, a couple of minutes right after helping to launch Hack the Pentagon, which was the very first bug bounty program um, for the United States government and certainly the first bug bounty program of its kind in the world um, against military targets. And uh, before that, I had been a strategist at Microsoft, launched their first bug bounty programs, wrote their vulnerability disclosure policy. And before that, I was a professional penetration tester, AKA ethical hacker for hire. Um, but that's enough intros for now. I'm gonna turn it over to Chris. Well, somewhat humbled by the whole thing. Um, Chris Roberts, obviously uh, a fairly varied and intriguing bag brand, all sorts of interesting stuff, both civilian and government side of the world. You know, from Katie's standpoint, the ethical hacking side of things, the assessment stuff, the red teaming side of the world, the consultative stuff. Nowadays, spending a lot more time with Hillbilly Hit Squad, doing a lot of stuff with small and medium businesses and really just virtual CISO stuff threat intelligence, deception, and a few other things. So yeah, just you know, keeping fingers in all sorts of pies. So I have to say, and I have to say this about both of you, um, you know, hackers are gonna hack no matter what. And we should be really grateful because the majority of hackers are hacking things that make everybody stronger and better. So with that, um, how would you guys define this concept that we've heard about and is now like an industry term of ethical hacking? You know, if you were to speak to someone in a very simple way, how would you guys define that? Well, I, I can take the first stab at it. You know, vulnerabilities are a fact in software. Every piece of software has bugs. And, you know, hackers are the type that, that go out of their way to find bugs, but sometimes we find them by accident or like I call it a hacksident, accidents happen. Um, and it's really a matter of what you decide to do with that information that, you know, that, that truly defines your ethics in hacking. And, um, you know, I think that it, it's not necessarily a black and white line of how you choose to disclose those vulnerabilities. We can get into that a little bit later. There's been an ongoing 20 plus year debate about the best way to disclose vulnerabilities to keep people safe. But it is just a matter of making the best choice that, you know, to you that protects the most people. I love that. And, and Katie, you know, we talked about this before, but like when um, we talk about offensive hacking uh, or offensive uses uh, versus the ethicality of that, how would you describe that? Well, you know, I, it's interesting because that term is, is, you know, it conjures up a lot of negativity, right? Mm -hmm. Offensive use, offensive hacking, but it's simply a term to describe what you're what you're using it for. Um, I think that you know offensive capabilities are incredibly important for organizations to understand and if they are you know able to afford in-house offensive security testing capabilities that's even better. Um, I think that for the general public when they hear offensive um, security they think cyber criminals and it's not really the same thing. Um, I'd love to hear Chris's thoughts on this because he's done a lot of recent work in this area. Yeah. And Chris, if you could also say, tell us, you know, like how you got into this field, because you've done so many cool hacks. Maybe you could tell us about that as well. Yeah. Some of them, unfortunately, a little more publicly than others um, for good or for bad, you know, and again, to Katie's point, we'll get into the whole disclosure thing, because that's uh, that's a whole minefield of, of interesting stuff. So, I mean, I started back in 1980 give or take a bit i mean i'm i'm i came out of the early, late 60s early 70s is when i kind of first appeared and and so early 80s was really starting to get into it and understanding and, and for me it takes that hacker mentality which is 
what is it? How does it work? What can I do with it? Oh, that's interesting. Can I try and get to do this? Could I do this? Can I? It's that intrigue. It's taking the box that we've been given and going, well, that's kind of cool, throwing it away and going, okay, what are the rules? How do I expand on them? And for me, it was all about gaming. So I started messing around with this stuff really probably when I was 13, 14, 15 years old. I didn't like losing at the games. So I took the game, you know, I took it off of the tape and the cartridge and put it in and looked at the code and went, oh, if I change that, if I modify that, if I do something with it, all of a sudden the cards turn up in my favor. And so that was the, and then you know, a couple of other things getting yelled at by a few banks and a few other places. And, you know, off we go from there and space stations and stuff. Um, but a lot of it was just taking something where somebody says, you have to stay here and going, what if? Um, and I think that's really the ethos. You, know, you go back to what is hacking. To me, hacking is that it's questioning. It's mm -hmm. something I wish we as humans would do much more of. It's just asking one more question. That's all it is. I think there's a brilliant Carl Sagan quote about that as well, that, you know, it's that we have enough education to know something about a subject, but not enough to question the education that we're getting or something like this. It's a brilliant quote. I'm totally messing it up. But maybe you could also tell us, like, in light of all the things you've learned versus what you've been taught, uh, what would you say was your proudest moment, you know, of the thing you figured out by yourself in, in terms of hacking? I, it's, it's, oh, that's in, I see the brain, the stuff I'm messing around with the brain is, is like ridiculously fascinating. Ton of fun stuff. We're doing a bunch of stuff with, you know, ironically, these crazy sized things, doing a bunch of stuff with EEG sensors on the brain and trying to actually understand how the brain works when it sees things, moves things, feels things, and everything else. So many, many years ago, it was all about hacking the technology, hacking the game, hacking the systems. For me now, it's a lot about the body and the human. So I've been working for a number of years. We did a bunch of research uh, on hacking nanotechnology and biotech that was going into the body. And then I started looking at the brain and going, okay, what can we do with the brain? So I looked at EEG sensors, looked at manipulating, looked at all sorts of paramedic architectures inside the brain to accentuate the signals. And really now I've got to a point where not with, I've actually got a pair of EEG headsets. When I walk into the lab here, I can get the computer to turn on because I'm thinking about it, it recognizes me. Same with a bunch of other things I've got in here. That's the fun part, but I think it's really getting to that process. But probably it's also knowing people like Katie, knowing people like you, and and having an amazing community around us. That I think is the most important part for me is having an amazing community you can just ask because you can't know everything. And being able to ask questions and being humble enough to know to ask questions. I think that's one of those life lesson things you tend to understand as you get older. So for the folks like who are at South by Southwest, I'm sure like if they thought of an ethical hacker, they wouldn't necessarily think of someone hacking an EEG or trying to do something with med tech necessarily. Katie, you know, can you give us like a, a sort of overview of all of the different hacks that have actually improved all different other professions other than the ones that we would commonly associate with? Sure. I mean, you know, all technology, as I said, contains flaws. And if they don't invest in the security engineering and methodology that, that has been developed to build security in from the very beginning of the product development life cycle, which is often the case with, with organizations that are rushed to get a product to market. And especially we see this in medical device security um, a lot or medical device insecurity, as it were, where these are small innovative startups that, you know, typically, and I heard this straight from the FDA, they typically take, uh, you know, a couple of doctors who have a medical problem Problem they think they can solve with an electronic device or improve upon existing electronic devices. And they outsource the development of that code to a small, you know, essentially embedded in your body IoT device. So ethical hacking has proven to be a very important pathway for folks who are, you know, trying to improve quality of life and human health. And they, they have, you know, they have the intelligence and knowledge to do that from the medical standpoint. But they lack the sophistication on the software security side, and they need the help of ethical hackers to help point them in the right direction. So I've actually seen um, not just researchers embrace that, um, but some medical device manufacturers have come around as well. And the FDA is fully embraced. And they were actually among the earliest adopters in the US government of embracing the idea of involving ethical hacking as part of the natural life cycle of checking up on security of products. So where else should this be? You know, I mean, it's great. everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yes. So, so you're, you're speaking to the choir, but um, uh, like which companies should also embrace this? I mean, where are the areas where it's clearly not present that should embrace this as part of their business strategy? 
Chris, Katie? I got a good one for this one. Um, how about a large manufacturing organization that does a lot of shipping and, and has a really good internet presence that maybe builds a doorbell that occasionally might set fire to the building? Um, that would be a good example of maybe ethical yeah. hacking. Um, you know, without naming names, you know, how can you actually ping the doorbell and burn the house down? I think to Katie's point, Katie says it, you know, as a developer and as something else, and, and we see some amazing stuff and everybody's focused on, I got to get the product out. And this isn't just about security and building it into life cycle. It's much more about having those other ideas, having a different perspective, having a different way of thinking. Everybody says, hey, you know, perfect example. When I do interviews, when I interview people to come into the company, I give them a teacup. I say, hey, here's my teacup and I've actually got a good cup of tea in here. Give me 10 or 15 different ways that you can get the tea out of this cup. And it's really interesting to see the mindset of people who can think of that and go, well, I could, you know, turn it upside down. I could suck it out. I could, but then you get the hacker who goes, well, I'm going to turn off localized gravity on this one, or I'm going to train the squirrels to come in and dunk their tails in, or I'm going to burrow underneath it, or I'm going to take a molecular architecture. And all of a sudden you see this amazing creativity that the person that designed the cup had no thoughts that it might even possibly come into that kind of, under that kind of scrutiny. So for me, that's the hacker community is looking at something going kind of cool, but here's 20 other things I can do with it, of which 10 of them are good and 10 of them are like, you might want to think about actually locking this, securing it, saving it and whatever else you need to do with it. I love that. And, and so like, I, I like this idea that we also, you know, need to kind of think about this creativity when hiring. So what other qualifications should we look at when we hire? I mean, and obviously not just the ethic and ethical hacker qualifications, but in general. Uh, Katie, do you have any tips? Well, you know, I think that a lot of organizations, like I said, they start out with no security in mind and nobody internally to really advocate for it. And sometimes they seek outside experts as their first foray, which I think is, you know, it's, it's a decent approach if you, you know, let's say you're, you're hiring professional penetration testers under NDA and contract as your first foray, that, that makes sense to me. But really, you want to be cultivating this kind of culture internally. And what I see especially um, that has been, you know, perhaps this has always been the way, but as I see startups come to my company and ask for help and advice in how do we engage with ethical hackers in the community, the first thing I ask them is, how many ethical hackers do you have employed right now internally? And when they say none, or there's no security people here at all, and we're just going to you know, go straight from the engineers who wrote the bugs straight to the hackers to, to get more bugs, I say, well, you're probably going to miss some, some comprehensive fixes. You're probably going to miss some root, cause, uh, root causes of your vulnerabilities, and essentially you're playing whack-a-bug. So you know, in trying to build your own security expertise, I think is, is very, very essential. You can definitely seek outside help for it at first, but going straight to the hacker community when you, know, you haven't done any due diligence, it's a recipe for having your hands full very, very quickly. I, I think this is really kind of fundamental to uh, figuring out what do I do first and which prioritization, but I suppose it's also a sense of urgency that's felt by companies, not necessarily in the right places. And Chris, you talked about this too, about like, you know, what would we do if it was a life and death kind of situation? Do you think hacking in itself can save lives? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm totally with Katie on this one. I mean, Katie's done, Katie's like the role model for how to build the program properly. I, no two ways about it. And I think this is something we in the community have had a problem with for, as Katie said, 20, 20 plus years at least. I've got a whole bunch of cease and desist. I have a folder of cease and desists for the last 20 plus years. And I think when you look at it now, a, a really good friend of mine, uh, Ryan Clotier, has an amazing way of putting it. We are analog humans, very much so operating in a digital world. Mm -hmm. And if we look at how we are interacting more and more with technology, we're moving more and more to embedded technology, augmented technology, technology that takes over our lives, rules our lives, works our lives, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. No longer when we get it wrong, is it simply reboot the computer? Mm -hmm. That doesn't work in life anymore. When you reboot that computer, people die. And I think that's where we get to a point where it's just like, we have to step this up much more effectively. Okay, I don't know if there's room in this in this for this brief story, but you just reminded me of a funny hacking story. So oh, 
Go. Okay. So where reboot the computer did not work at all, right? So Disney World. And uh, I'm there with my family and my aunt is with us. And um, I see we're at the Imaginarium, you know, at Epcot. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there's a bunch of computers, laptops that are set up, but it's empty. Nobody's playing it. There's a big video screen. Nobody's playing, you know, it's just kind of doing like sort of a screensaver kind of pattern. And so I walk up to one of these, one of these computers and I'm like, oh, what is this thing? You know, and nobody was around. And so I see that it's actually, you know, it's got a browser with no URL bar, right? They've locked down the brow locked down the browser. So I'm like, huh, how is it getting to this website? It must be a config file. Okay, let me go find it. Oh, here it is. Oh, I want to show my aunt some pictures of me and some college friends in Mexico. So I <laughs> go to the website, I, I load it in, you know, using the config file. Not really hacking per se. I just was figuring out how this thing was doing it. So then I'm showing the slideshow at, Ep at Epcot of my Mexico trip with my with my goofy friends. And I hear, and you reminded me of this earlier, Chris, I hear from behind me, ma'am, step away from the machine. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, oh, let me put it back. Hold on. And they're like, ma'am, ma'am, we'll take it from here. Step away. Step away. And I'm about, to get, yeah. I'm about to get kicked out of Epcot with my little sister, my auntie, my mom watching. And I'm like, no, I just need to get it off of my Mexico photo. Oh, okay, I'll step away. So there they were. And, you know, it was in the Imaginarium. So this thing kind of rotates. So we go to the non-rotating perimeter and we go off to other things. And anyway, the rotating thing comes around a couple more times. There's more of them. They keep trying to reboot the machine, but of course it's just reading the same <laughs> file that I altered. So I'm sitting there like, should I, I, uh, you know what? They told me to leave. So I'm, I'm just, so to this day, there might be a slideshow of my like 25 year old Mexico trip with the, awesome. with the sombrero. Anyway, yeah, rebooting doesn't work, but see, I wasn't causing harm. Was I accessing that computer in an unauthorized manner? I'm sure. Yes. But you know, I just wanted to show my aunt some pictures. And which brings me to a perfect <laughs> point of Chris, which is just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. Yeah. Um, let's weigh in on this one because I mean, there's a lot of young hackers and look, Katie, you know what you're doing. You, you very clearly did something that was not intended to have any other consequences than the one you had in mind. But of course there can be unintentioned consequences which really have quite a ripple impact uh, across this even when doing something a relatively simple uh, attack. So maybe we can weigh in on that uh, Chris statement, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Yeah, I think it's, again, we'll go back to where we are today. So to Katie's point, you know, you go back to the Epcot stuff and you go back to the stuff we used to do years ago, you could influence some rather interesting and somewhat critical stuff. But mm -hmm. now you fast forward to where we are today, you've got, you know, 20 plus billion devices connected to, you know, the internet by one way, shape, form or another. And you know, we've seen numerous examples where critical infrastructure is connected to the internet. Now, just because you can get in there and go, oh, this is cool. Let me try, let me play, let me do, let me do this. You don't necessarily know what you're influencing. This is one of the biggest frustrations that I think a lot of us have in the industry with uh, the hacking, with the assessment, with all the pen testing is, you unfortunately get people that come into it go, I know what I'm doing. I've got three years on a paper tiger and I'm going to go basically pen test either, you know, a healthcare facility yeah. or a critical infrastructure. And you run a scan and all of a sudden half the damn network disappears. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. And so to me, it's that taking a step back. And this is where we get to the business. This is where we get to the communication and collaboration with the organizations around us. And again, I'll go back to Katie you know, the ability for her to say, hey, let's bring the two teams together. Let's bring the defense side of it world, you know, the very, very rigid military side of the world. And let's bring a bunch of us together and say, hey, work together effectively, mm -hmm. communicate, collaborate, cooperate effectively. That's huge. I think that's what's missing. That is something that we have to do these days before we go break into everything. We could get a lot better at collaboration amongst the entire community. We suck at that. No, I agree. Um, Katie, but maybe we can like take this from where Chris just left it. Like, is there some sort of boundary setting that we can do between, you know, a sort of right or wrong or black or white? I mean, what's that critical thinking around outcomes that we should be considering? Well, you know, I have tried to disclose vulnerabilities to organizations over the years. I have coordinated vulnerabilities that affected my organization plus others. And I've been on the receiving end, you know, uh, as, as a, 
um, an open source Linux uh, developer. I was on the receiving end of open source bug reports and li shared library issues and been on the receiving end as a closed source vendor, you know, when I worked at Microsoft. And I can tell you that the, the biggest black and white that affects outcomes is the reaction of the receiving party. It is not actually what the hackers are doing necessarily. It is literally how these organizations, even if it's, you know, three people and one of them decides that they're going to start a security response center and respond to vulnerability reports all the way up to the biggest software company in the world. It is, it, you know, the, the real difference in outcomes is, you know, whether they welcome the reports in the first place whether they communicate effectively to the point what Chris was making, communicate effectively about the status of the ongoing investigation, don't make any legal threats to the people who are trying to tell you about the vulnerability and actually work in the best interest in common with that person who reported the vulnerability to you to the betterment of your user security experience. And that's me, that's the real black and white. That is the real, you know, decider of how these things turn out, um, you know, in real tangible security outcomes. Mm -hmm. Spot on. And Chris, do you want to weigh in there? Is there anything that we can say to draw lines? I, I mean, Katie hit it perfectly. And the irony of this whole thing is, is I'm sitting on something, uh, a very, very good friend and somebody who's also pretty well known in the industry sent something to me yesterday. He's working with a Wired reporter about a release. He went to the organization and said, hey, you've got problems. Here they are, A, B, C, and D, E, F, and G. Here's the data. Here's what I found. Tried to hand it over. They went legal on it, you know, as, as Katie is well aware. When we go in, we go in with the best intentions. Um, we go in and say, hey, look, we found some issues. Sometimes we go in a little bit steamrollery and say, a bunch of numpties, you know, you should have done A, B, and C. Mm -hmm. Other times we're like, hey, can you please fix this? Because you're exposing all of this. And you get met with, sometimes you're met with like, hey, yeah, help us. And you're like, yes. Sometimes you're met with, and here's our lawyers. And you're like, that I'm done. I don't want to deal with any more lawyers. And all sorts of other, and unfortunately, in this case, he got met with lawyers, so he went to Wired. Now, what I'm doing is validating the data, looking on all sorts of interesting places, um, and and it's frustrating because you know we're how many years into this? I mean, goodness knows how many years into this. You've got amazing programs set up. You've got great ways of doing it, and yet we still have companies that are in denial. They just don't want to admit that somebody's gotten in, and it's it's a fact of life these days. Everybody's going to get broken into. Yep. It's what do you do about it? And how do you how do you deal with it? But I do think that there are some types of, you know, what's acceptable in terms of proving the evidence of the breach versus abusing the vulnerability that got you there. Yes. Um, there are lines that I think we do need to draw, not just expectation of behavior from the company perspective, but also from the hacker perspective. So yeah. what would some of those look like? Oh, I've got one for that. So I testified before Congress a couple of years ago, or I guess it was 2018, so it's almost three years ago, on um, the Uber data breach that was um, sort of uh, hidden away and covered up by a bug bounty payout that was really an extortion payout to these criminals. I don't even want to call them hackers. They were extortionists, they were criminals. But basically they, um, they found uh, some, you know, some, some credentials and they basically, e at first they emailed the CTO of Uber at the time through you know, LinkedIn or something. He pointed them to their bug bounty program, which was the right thing for him to do. Right. Um, and then after that, you know, apparently uh, they were told, you know, okay, we'll, we'll give you a bug bounty and whatnot. And they said, well, you know, imagine what somebody could do with this. And they, and they basically were, were sort of challenged to, to prove that there was anything else you know, that, that could be done with those credentials. And instead of showing proof of concept of maybe showing a couple of records, they downloaded all 57 million records from Uber. And that is much more than proving a point. So for that one, it was fairly clear that mm -hmm. their intention was to you know, expose that data if they weren't paid a six figure sum, which they negotiated with Uber. And then Uber used their bug bounty platform to go ahead and pay these people. And what's what's more is that not only did that send the wrong message, you know, that it was the wrong thing for Uber right. to do and the wrong thing for those hackers to do, those particular criminals, but the Justice Department went after the former Uber CTO 
because of that decision to do that. Why? Because the hackers went on to attack others in the exact same manner. They tried to get um, a LinkedIn subsidiary and that was immediately indicted, which that one should have been, right? They right. again tried to download all yeah. of the data and yeah. extort figure minimum payment out of their victim. So yeah, absolutely. There are certain things where it's like that you don't need 57 million records to prove you could access a record potentially, right? Exactly. You are a bad actor at that yeah. point. Yeah. And I do think it should be fair to say that, you know, when companies are trying to set up uh, responsible disclosure or vulnerability disclosure programs or um, bug bounties that they really do need to define the acceptable use of those policies in order to improve security because that's the only reason we're doing this. Um, and if those things are, are uh, fair, then I think you know the other things can be set up. So going to those other things, what are like legal considerations that we need to pay attention to? Not just this, where there might be some collateral damage, but are there any specific legal things that we should think about? terms of where you can and cannot trespass or is it all open if it's online? It depends on where you are. You know, honestly, there are different laws for different jurisdictions. There are different laws for even passing proof of concept code across borders. So it really depends. You know, that's kind of a complex question um, that hackers have to navigate largely on their own, which is another reason why, you know, we need to make it easier and more straightforward for ethical hackers to come forward um, because it's such a maze. And what I've seen is I've seen well-intentioned um, bug bounty policies or vul vulnerability disclosure policies set up by receiving parties that have this sort of safe harbor clause. And I say it's well-intentioned because claiming some uh, little legal legalese at the bottom of your bug bounty program is a safe harbor for anyone, no matter what jurisdiction they live in, is, is misleading, right? So I worry about hackers relying too much on that, you know, sort of quote unquote safe harbor clause when really it's, you know, no one can grant you what I call hacklematic immunity, right? No one can say that everything that you're going to do is going to be perfectly right. legal yeah. where you are. Yeah, yeah. Hey, and um, uh Chris, I'm just going to ask you, do you have any like personal antidote uh, with friends or other things you've seen if like ethical hacking fails or missteps or stuff that can go better? Um, I remember Jennifer Granick uh, used to talk about this uh, a lot, you know, when she was coaching yeah. hackers in the early days when we didn't have all this legislation, we didn't have clear policies and practices about how to do it right, you know? Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, you know, I hate to say it, I'm probably one of the poster children for that, for that whole thing. Let's, let's be honest. I mean, if we go back to the research that a number of us started doing in 2008, 2009. I mean, we did vehicle, we did a whole bunch of stuff against vehicles, 05, 06 through to about 10 or 11. So 2010, 2011, we started looking at aviation and we looked really heavily at aviation. We started looking at planes on the ground and we started to do disclosures. We started to try to do ethically, you know, disclosures the right way. Very quickly, we started looking at any kind of avionic systems that were in flight, in motion, all those other kind of good things. And we spent the best part of four years navigating and trying to get organizations to pay attention, trying to get them to listen, trying to go the disclosure route, trying to do it all the proper way, getting wrapped up under one year and two year NDAs to not see any change. And obviously at that point you get frustrated. So in the end it went public. It actually went public without us saying anything. And then we just got embroiled in the whole thing. And then lo and behold, you know, you get yanked off of an airplane because you put a tweet out that, you know, just because you can doesn't mean you necessarily should. And I think that to me is one of those challenges. That's where I love seeing what's happened now, which is we have much better structure around how to do disclosures. I mean, I still do it now. I'll still go out and I'll still break things and do things and stuff. Now, some companies have learned, but others have not. Um, and there's a lot of catch up. So for me, it's, it really is. I, and, and Katie's got it right, which is, look, if you have the scale and the structure and the time to set up the programs yourselves, great. If not, there's enough other companies out there that will do it for you. Some mm -hmm. are good, some are iffy, some have good structures, some don't. It's entirely, at that point, it's, it's at your discretion. But for me, you should simply assume that as soon as you put a presence on the network, somebody somewhere, one of us is going to be like, oh, that looks interesting. Let me see what I can do to it. I think that's a really good thing. So once it's online, it's fair game in a way to yeah. the whole planet. Yeah. So you shouldn't be too surprised if someone finds a weakness or a vulnerability in the thing that you just put out there. 
Yeah. And I think it's it's a pride thing. You know, again, this I know with the aviation stuff that we dealt with, we ran into pride. I mean, we were in CEOs' offices here. We tried we had conversations with Toulouse, we had conversations out on the West Coast in Seattle, neck of the woods. And a lot of it was pride. It was pride, it's that pride before a fall. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And unfortunately, what ended up happening with some of our stuff and some of the stuff that will probably will never come to light is people lost lives. Yeah. And that's where it becomes, you know, you have you have multiple instances where aviation systems go down, people lose lives, and eventually they put their hand up and go, oh, yeah, yeah, we had a bit of a problem there. That's yeah. A chill, a little bit too late, unfortunately. Yeah. And I think that was a really good point you made earlier about, you know, sometimes in order to fix things, there just has to be enough lives lost in a way in order to, yeah, go ahead. I mean, that's, I mean, you know, we got, we had this question the other day and it's a terrible, it's a terrible way of looking at it. But at this point, it's reality. It's like, okay, in order for me to fix some of the medical device systems, how many people do you want me to kill? In order for you to fix your IoT architectures, how many houses do you want me to burn down? How many of this? And as humans, we're not good at, at foreseeing that. You know, as kids, we grow up, you get told, don't touch the kettle because it's hot. What do we do? We touch the darn thing. We have to experience before we change. And I see that, and we all see that so often in our industry. And it, it, it's unfortunate that part of my feeling is like, how many dead bodies do I have to put between you and your keyboard before you will pay attention to this? Katie, you want to weigh in there? You know, yeah, I mean, honestly, what's really sad about that is that, you know, I think I think Chris is right in that um, humans are, are incapable of really assessing the gravity of, of the risk that they face until, you know, until some really dire things happened. I mean, if we take a page out of, you know, U.S. history and the establishment of uh, the Environmental Protection Agency. Mm-hmm. It took the Cuyahoga River catching fire from yeah. pollution, and it wasn't the first time it caught fire. It had to catch fire multiple times for for the EPA to be created to deal with the impact we were having on our on our environment unchecked. And you know, the software industry has been growing in technology, you know, and in, in importance to society unchecked. When it comes to liability, right? So they've they've pushed software liability um, laws way way down, you know, in terms of priority. Companies that used to be considered big, you know, big companies, and they are big companies like Microsoft, IBM, and whatnot, they were, you know, global companies playing and influencing the laws and politics of the, uh, you know, companies and uh, businesses, um, sorry, and governments around the world. Mm -hmm. And now we have, you know, these mega company social media companies that are influential across more than technology, but also, you know, obviously in in politics and, and how we are governed, you know, in the world. So I think that, you know, this, it can't be understated enough that we need to actually listen to some of these hackers, some of us who are coming forward before there are catastrophic, additional catastrophic consequences to ignoring uh, security vulnerabilities and privacy vulnerabilities. So let's talk about one of those for a second. Um, It was the other day on Twitter uh, earlier this week about all of, uh, you could just find on Shodan, uh, which is a a site that scans for all kinds of vulnerabilities. If you were looking uh, for nuclear power plants that were using the TeamViewer software, you could kind of find this vulnerable version attached to the back end of the plant. So, I mean, what would your program or idea be? I mean, like Biden is gonna start an entirely new cybersecurity program, that's the good news. So how would we try to deal with this type of software hardware interdependency uh, across critical infrastructure? I mean, the thing is they, uh, you know, lots of industries are under-resourced, chronically under-resourced. And that means that they are doing the best with the tools that they have available. And I'm not saying that there's no blame to be had there. It's just that 
it's so common and their business case is to, you know, keep the water running or keep the power running. You know what I mean? Um, so they prioritize for that function above all other functions. And they are, you know, as a result, have deprioritized a lot of the security and privacy and integrity components of a good security program and instead of concentrated on availability. So one, you know, I think the Biden administration needs to take an extremely hard look at the under-resourcing problem in critical areas across you know, federal, state, and local governments and across um, critical infrastructure. Because we can't just snap our fingers and get everybody upgraded and have everybody with state-of-the-art um, connectivity and VPN solutions and all that stuff that you would want. Um, we just can't have that overnight without a serious investment in resources. Yep. Chris? I'm going to add on that. I'll build on that one because a lot of it also comes down. A lot of it comes down to us as well. It's the communication collaboration thing. So it, it, it takes two of us. It takes us in the industry to effectively have the conversations with the businesses, critical infrastructure doesn't matter who it is. It takes us talking their language. We mm -hmm. can't go in and go, hey, if you buy this next generation AI powered firewall with magic scented stuff, it'll be perfectly, no, that, that's that got to stop. Our own industry has got to take a step back and actually take more accountability. I mean, Katie said it, it's accountability, number one. Yeah. I think Katie's point, number two, you know, the, the, the resources are a huge point, but it's also collaboration in those resources. You know, for years, a lot of us in the industry have also stood up and gone off a crying out loud, you know, oh, the users, what are we going to do with them? Oh, the developers, they, they're terrible. The DBAs, we've got to go lock them in a room. No. Users, most important resource. How do we educate them more effectively? Developers, operations, let's come together and how do we work this solution more effectively? And I think that's going to be a big part of it. And that's us. That's us eating a bit of humble pie and going, how can we come back to the table and how can we, through industry, through leadership and people in this industry, go, hey, we yeah. have a problem. How do we fix it more effectively? So, like, you know, you and I uh, have been in Israel, I think, twice together. Um, yep. So if we go back, um, and even now with the corona response, you know, I think the majority of the country has already been vaccinated. Yeah. Uh, I always find them. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. But. I always find them so inspirational uh, when it comes to cybersecurity as well. Like the other yeah. day I was, I don't know why I was Googling their page and they have like a national number, like a 911 number, but then to report your security incident, holy free holies, yep. you know, like <laughs> yep. you've they've got it right. Yeah. But I mean, how, where else should we be learning from? What other practices should we deploy to really have this sort of national awareness of how important security is for our daily lives? I think it's, it's taking it away from security. In Israel, it's safety. Yeah. If you really think about it, it's safety. I think, I mean, everybody around them wants to kill them. I mean, it's as simple as that. And the difference is the mentality. I remember being over there years and years ago and talking to some of the IAF guys and they're like, look, in the US, you have luxury. In Europe, we have luxury. You know, if somebody's going to lob a missile at us, we've got enough time to make a cup of tea before anything's really going to happen. Over there, they have seconds. Yeah. So it's a different mentality and a very, very different mindset. And I think we have to adapt to that mindset much more effectively. Because again, analog world, digital world is now as one. And we've got to somehow or other understand the consequences. That ties in really well with what Katie just said about like, you know, misaligned priorities and incentivization. So if we can get those aligned and appropriately uh, apply the sense of urgency, we might actually get there. So um, is there some advice that you guys would give to either young hackers out there or old hackers out there, 40 plus hackers out there uh, looking to use their skills or learning stuff or actionable advice for people who aren't hackers, but want to kind of you know, protect themselves against hackers? Katie? Well, um, for the advice for non-hackers and, and just anyone who wants to protect themselves against attacks, um, I would say that, you know, turn on multi-factor authentication in all your accounts and ideally use something other than SMS, use, use an authenticator app. Um, etc. Um, I would say use strong passwords, unique passwords, and manage them with a password manager. That's that's general advice for for everyone to avoid phishing attacks or help protect yourself. Um, always double check if you receive something that seems a little suspicious before you open it or click on it, um, and use you know sort of a, an off. 
um, you know, a, another channel to verify with that person. Did you really send this thing or, you know, is this really you? Um, I actually had a, an official email come from a new employee at a place where I'm a, I'm a, a remote fellow. And they sent it from their Gmail saying, will you add me on WhatsApp? Here's my phone number. I haven't gotten my official email yet. And I was like, what is going on here? <laughs> Turns out that wasn't a fish, but I verified through an outside channel. And that's the kind of thing that, you know, I think that, you know, if, if uh, you know, general public got more used to um, trust, but verify, you know, and suspicious of those things and added those, you know, those additional security features that would help a lot from uh, them being, you know, the subject of, of an opportunistic attack, which is what most people have to defend against, not usually a targeted attack. If you're the subject of a targeted attack, that's like saying you're being hunted by ninjas. Good luck to you. You will probably not survive. <laughs> you will probably, they will probably get their objective. Um, but then, you know, in terms of advice to hackers out there, um, you know, don't do anything that will cause you to have permanent trouble, right? You know, it's, it's, um, it's like get in some good trouble, but, you know, understand that nothing is really worth pushing it. Um, you know, live to hack another day, stay free to hack another day. Um, and if an organization rebukes your attempt to report a vulnerability to them, then you have some decisions about what you can do with that. You can drop it as zero day, you can work with the media, but ultimately, you know, it comes down to uh, a decision of how much more energy do you want to give that problem? And sometimes as, you know, I know Chris has probably done this in the past himself. Sometimes it's not worth the energy to continue to pursue it. So, you know, find the path of least resistance for you, try to do as much good as you can in the world. And hopefully, you know, eventually uh, an organization will employ you and value your skills and your and your work. And then um, I think the last piece of advice I would give is going back to the organizations themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, um, hackers are not there to call your baby ugly. They're there to point out some very interesting features. So it's important for you to be open-minded and listen to keep the lawyers at bay because yes, it's their job to protect you and your reputation and the company and its trade secrets, but it will be counteractive to your security goals and your longevity in the marketplace with your products if you refuse to listen to hackers who are trying to tell you something. So um, be open-minded and definitely get some help if you need it. Chris, any uh, parting words? Yeah, I got a couple of thoughts on this one. Thanks to Katie, because it really helped like prompt to things. So for me, it is, it's question more. It, it's, it's unfortunately, it's trust less question more. So exactly what Katie said, we, we're going to click. You can't tell people to go and click, but you can tell people to think before they click. That'd be number one. Number two, I'm going to actually adjust what Katie said, and I'm going to do validate, then maybe trust. You know, because we all trust, we're humans, we like trusting. Well, no, because unfortunately the world's not really that nice all the time. So validate, then do some trusting. Maybe, you know, to Katie's point, do a second call on things. Third one, for in our industry, for people in our industry, this is what I love about Hillbilly Hit Squad. Hillbilly Hit Squad, we are literally a bunch of folks and we're all over the place. My, one of my partners is, uh, he collects John Deere tractors, Model A's and Model B's. He's got hit and miss engines from the 1800s. And he and I collaborated on how to take out Pratt & Whitney and Boeing and GE engines. He's that mindset, but he, here on the computer, it's like watching this on the computer. So for me, it's partner up. Partner up with people in psychology, partner up with people in engineering, partner up with people outside of our world. In other words, get off of our own island, and go partner up with others around us. That's the biggest thing. The more people who are not technical, who are not IT, who are not geeks, who are not hackers that we can bring in, the more we stand the chance of helping to educate. I love these thoughts. Uh, bottom line, trust but verify or the Russian dovrai non povere. Yeah. And, <laughs> yep. and um, uh, make sure that you collaborate because the hackers certainly are. So, um, so final words, if you want to hear more from Katie and uh, Chris, uh, take a look at the podcast that they both recorded uh, on Avast Hacker Archives. You can find them wherever you find podcasts, but also on YouTube uh, forward slash Avast. And thank you so much for joining us here today. It was a pleasure to do this for South by Southwest. Thank you.